If you just discovered our show, you'll want to start listening at episode one. This is a Global Tell Link prepaid call from Daniel Green, an inmate at Tabor Correctional Institution. This call will be monitored and recorded. I never know when I'll get a call from Daniel. On this day in August 2020, when he called, we talked about Larry Demery being granted parole. Your first time is October of 2021. Um, I mean, what do you think your chances are? Uh, I mean, man, I'm, I'm, you know, my fight is to prove that I'm innocent in this case. And the only people that I'm truly concerned about believing that is James Jordan's family and his friends because they're the ones that lost somebody. Um, At the time, Daniel wasn't very hopeful that the parole commission would seriously consider releasing him for so many reasons. He tells me nothing in this case has been easy from the very beginning because of who he was convicted of killing. So trying to get paroled, it's no exception to this pattern. I already understood that it was going to be a hard fight. I already understood that I was up against something that's bigger than me. From WRAL Studios, this is Follow the Truth. The story of the James Jordan murder and the man who says he didn't do it. In this episode, Daniel Green's first shot at parole since he was convicted in 1996. It's a warm early fall day when I speak to the Reverend Dr. T. Anthony Spearman. He's sitting in a chair in the direct sunlight in front of the North Carolina governor's mansion, staging a one-man protest to bring attention to the cases of several men who have had their convictions vacated after spending many years in prison. But they haven't been pardoned by Governor Roy Cooper. Being pardoned in North Carolina is important, because it allows the wrongfully convicted person to get compensation from the state for their years spent in prison. Spearman, who headed the state NAACP from October 2017 to October 21, says these pardons are long overdue. He's quietly demanding Governor Cooper's attention. In this Toyota Camry, crunched up in the car uh, from back Did I mention that he's protesting by day and sleeping in his car by night? Spearman is passionate about the people he supports. And recently, he and the state NAACP announced their support for Daniel. This is a really big deal for Daniel. The NAACP doesn't just support anyone. They vet the cases they choose to throw their confidence behind. I'm, I'm one who is a sounding board for him. I'm able to listen to him and offer a measure of compassion to him, understanding his plight. And uh, Daniel is a person who has never known really the love of a father. And Spearman takes a few minutes away from his protest to speak with me about Daniel as a steady stream of traffic rushes by on the street. Recently, he's been intimately involved in Daniel's life and his case. He spoke on Daniel's behalf to the North Carolina Post-Release Supervision and Parole Commission. It is incumbent, I believe, upon them to understand that Daniel's situation and the case that he's dealing with has to be looked at with a different set of eyes. We'll get to Daniel's first opportunity for parole in a minute, but first, Let's go back to the year after James Jordan was murdered and talk about how the parole process has changed in North Carolina since then. In 1994, state lawmakers passed the Structured Sentencing Act, which eliminated parole for felonies. But anyone who is convicted of a felony that occurred prior to this date is still eligible. That's why Daniel Green and Larry Demery, who were both convicted of the 1993 James Jordan murder, can be considered. 
The Parole Commission is an independent group of four people appointed by the governor. In most cases, they don't meet with the defendants or hold formal hearings, but they do allow input on behalf of the convicted person. They also allow input from the victim's family. But this is a confidential process, so we have no way of knowing if the state or the Jordans weighed in. Each case is considered on an individual basis every one to three years, depending on the crime. Murder cases are reviewed every three years. The majority of the commissioners must agree to grant parole for a person in order for them to be released. They consider things like what crimes the person is convicted of committing, how they've handled themselves in prison, do they have a long list of infractions, and what kind of support will they have in the community if they're released. There is no formal requirement for admission of guilt or remorse, but it certainly helps. After all, the commissioners are human beings, and they want to see that someone has evolved in prison grown into a respectable citizen who will do well in the outside world. Few offenders are granted parole on their first go-around. And even if they are, it almost always comes with conditions, like a program called MAP, which stands for Mutual Agreement Parole Program. It's essentially a series of steps the person must take in preparation for their release. Academic classes or vocational classes, things to get them ready for the big transition into the community outside the prison walls. A parole date is set in the future, usually more than a year out. And during that time, the person must complete these steps and most importantly, stay out of trouble. Otherwise, their parole date may be pushed out or even terminated. Larry Demery, the man who testified against Daniel in exchange for a plea deal, was granted parole on his third try. He was assigned to a MAP program and was scheduled to be released in August 2023. But he got charged with new infractions, having a substance he was not supposed to have, which usually refers to drugs or alcohol, and having contraband, which is basically anything you're not allowed to have in prison. His parole date was pushed out to August 2024. We don't know for sure if this was the reason his parole was derailed, but it seems pretty likely there's a connection. Larry and Daniel went to prison for the same crime. So why does Larry get the chance for parole years before Daniel? Well, That plea deal he made with the state reduced time on his sentence for other charges he faced that were in addition to the Jordan murder. Daniel had to serve a longer mandatory amount of time for his additional charges since he didn't have a deal. September 21st, 2021. The first parole consideration for Daniel Green is underway. It was a conference call with the chairman of the commission, Bill Fowler. On the call were Daniel's attorney, Chris Muma, who is the executive director of the North Carolina Center on Actual Innocence, Anthony Spearman, who was the president of the NAACP in North Carolina at the time, and a Robeson County pastor named Tom Jones. All spoke in favor of Daniel's release. Of course, Muma led the discussion. So we wanted to present as strong a case as possible, even though it was the first time and it's very, very rare for anybody to get any type of parole relief the first time through. She didn't want to speak about exactly what was said in that meeting until the commissioners made their decision. I didn't want to take any misstep. I did not want to take a step that might influence any of the commissioners in their decision. Although these meetings are not open to the public or the media, I covered the story of what happened behind closed doors for WREL-TV with some help from one of the people who spoke to the commission, Robeson County Pastor Tom Jones. Daniel Green has been in prison since his arrest in 1993, and for the first time in 28 years, he is eligible to be considered for parole. And I advised the board, the one that we talked with, that if they would pray about it uh, and 
Use common sense and don't be persuaded by politics. Pastor Tom Jones is from Robeson County. Yes, that Robeson County. The place where James Jordan's murder took place. He's been talking with Daniel for about five years. They've become good friends. Jones considers himself a father figure to Daniel. And I believe every word he said, because he acknowledged the mistake he had made, and he was sorry for that. But uh, the actual murder, his friend turned his back on him. Jones spoke with me a few hours after that conference call with the parole commissioner. He told me the thing that convinced him to get more involved with Daniel's case, including speaking to the parole commission, was watching the docu-series about the case called Moment of Truth. The five-part series was co-produced by Capital Broadcasting Company, the parent company of WRAL Studios that produces this podcast. The docu-series is still available all over the world on the Amazon streaming service IMDb TV. And that just solidified my belief that he was innocent. After having watched that, called uh, as many people as I possibly could, including the president of the local NAACP, and he contacted the state president. I know that he's innocent. I believe that Dan- Anthony Spearman said one of his main goals was not only to share Daniel's truth, but to explain how the stigma of who he was convicted of killing has followed him for decades. You know, he was caught up in something, and so as a result of that, they began labeling him. They began profiling him to a very large degree that has stuck with him for the rest of his life. Take, for example, Daniel's infractions while in prison. There are 99. They mostly involve profane language, disobeying orders, fighting, which Spearman says makes sense because Daniel entered prison with a target on his back. Those infractions on his record are important since good behavior in prison is something the parole commission takes into consideration. By contrast, Larry Demery has just 17 infractions on his prison record. Spearman told the parole commissioner his theory about what happened in July 1993 and why it happened. He believes Larry Demery betrayed his best friend in order to get a better deal for himself. I believe that Daniel was drawn in by a man who was his friend. Friendship means a lot to Daniel. Relationships mean a lot to Daniel. It was Daniel's loyalty that night that caused him to leave wherever he was and to go to help dispose of the body that evening. But that's all Daniel did, dispose of the body. He wasn't there when the murder took place. Spearman has also struck up a relationship with Daniel's mother, Elizabeth. And he wants her to be able to see her son again. He told the parole commissioner that Daniel can't wait three years which is the next time he will be eligible to seek parole if he's denied this time. They have something in place where they don't usually extend these paroles to the the person on the first time. And I've said to them then, I said, I hope you let those things go and really decide this case on its merits and the merits of the man, because Daniel also has a mother who is very ill. She's, you know, and may not last three years if you deny him the right to parole. And Spearman also told the parole commissioner something pretty astounding. He said he and his wife, Janice, would be happy to have Daniel come live with them at their home in Greensboro if he's released. That's right. The former head of the state's NAACP wants Daniel to come home with him. His room is waiting for him. (laughs) You know, if they were to say, okay, we're going to grant you this then he is free to come and rest with us. And uh, we will do everything to support him uh, to whatever the next steps are going to be. I was curious how Spearman got his wife on board with Daniel potentially coming to live with them. Uh, My wife is convinced because she's watched the moments of truth with me and and follow the truth with me, uh, listen to the podcast. I asked Spearman and Jones if they felt like they had done enough if they believed what they had said during the conference call 
would have the power to move the dial on Daniel's first real chance of freedom after all these years. I would certainly love to see Daniel free. But again, this is a political opponent and the politics of Robinson County and of North Carolina dictates to me that that possibility exists today that he won't be freed. I have a measure of cautious optimism, I guess you would say, and hoping, I'm hoping for the best, the very, very best. And if there's anything that I can do to push that along in these days moving up toward the time that they make their decision, I'm certainly going to do it. After the break, the Parole Commission gets ready to make its decision. Everyone, including Daniel, is on pins and needles waiting to see what will happen. Well, Lena, I can tell you those supporters, they were very direct. They want Green out of prison. They also are trying to... On October 22, 2021, the state released the Parole Commission's decision in the Daniel Green case publicly. Reporter Julian Grace covered the story for WRAL-TV. He says he's innocent of murder, so he saw parole. But today he was denied. Dejected, saddened by the decision that has been made. That's Reverend Spearman responding to the news the day it came down. Till the cows come home, I will continue. I would continue advocating on behalf of Daniel Green, and I, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Spearman is now retired from his NAACP post, but he's still an avid activist involved in a number of causes. I interviewed him again several weeks after the parole commission made its decision. Were you surprised that he didn't get it on this first go around? No, I wasn't surprised at all. As a matter of fact, I was kind of waiting for that to have happened. Um, I had ultimately been told that usually on the first occasion, it's uh, very unique for someone who is coming up before the parole board to receive a parole on the first, on the first attempt. Spearman is frustrated. He feels like no one including the Parole Commission and the courts, have really ever listened to Daniel. He says the documentary, Moment of Truth, and the podcast you're listening to right now have opened his eyes to what Daniel has been up against since the day he was arrested. Spearman vividly recalls the video in the docuseries of Sheriff Hubert Stone walking Daniel and Larry into the courthouse in Lumberton for their first appearance before a judge. Daniel, anything you want to say to the Jordan family? Anything you have to say to the Jordan family at all? I didn't kill them. That's what all I have to say. Michael Jordan. They basically set Daniel up from the beginning. Here's this young man, 19 years old, African-American, and you see Stone parading him and Larry through the streets of, I guess it was Lumberton at the time, but you know, parading them through the streets. And who's in the lead? Daniel is in the lead, and Daniel is the one that's speaking, and it just seems as if he's being set up to be the leader or the one who was responsible. I reached out to Daniel's attorney, Chris Muma. She didn't want to speak right after the decision was made. It was too emotional for her. But she agreed to speak with me a few weeks later. So it was a very, very long shot, but we had to pursue it. Muma knew there was little chance Daniel would be granted parole on his first opportunity. She tells us you only have the stage in front of the parole commission for a very brief moment in time. You have to cram in a lot quickly. So you got 30 minutes to introduce yourselves, to explain Daniel's case, to explain why you think he deserves parole and put your best case forward. We learned there were also a lot of letters sent to the commission on Daniel's behalf. Letters of support that will remain in his file for future parole consideration. Muma says she went into the process giving it everything she had, including having two strong voices, Pastor Jones and Reverend Spearman on the call supporting Daniel. Really kind of shocking for me 
was the then head of the NAACP, Reverend Spearman, came forward saying, you know, if Daniel got out, he could stay with Reverend Spearman. And Reverend Spearman would be a mentor for him and help him get on the right path and stay on the right path. And I've never heard of anything like that before in any of the parole cases that I've worked on. So I wanted to get Daniel's reaction to the parole decision. At first, he was reluctant to talk about it. He wanted to put his thoughts together before speaking about it. Don't get me wrong. Daniel loves to talk. But he also likes to find the right words and be prepared when he does. He told me he had hoped the parole commissioners would give him the same grace they had given Larry. I was hoping that those same elements would have played in my favor, and that did not happen. So uh, on one hand, I was not surprised. Uh, On the other hand, I was definitely, you know, disappointed. Daniel also understands that his infractions in prison definitely worked against him, even though he says they came from his need to defend himself behind bars. You know, a person may look at me and say, well, this guy has 99 write-ups. But you understand that you're in a type of environment that is not designed for people who have been falsely accused of anything or a person who is, like, actively trying to regain their freedom. But there is a silver lining. Daniel now has two men, two strong mentors in his corner, Spearman and Jones, who not only supported him at the parole conference, but show up for him every single day while he's in prison. And so you're talking about me having to benefit now of something that I've never had before in my life, where I can go to a man and I can seek guidance. And having them basically stand up for me and say, you know what, this man has value. So I'm just extremely grateful for those relationships. Uh, that's the like, biggest blessing that's come out of this for me. And so while the disappointment over the parole decision is very real for Daniel, he also feels valued in a way that he never has before. These men found me worthy. And I feel that when I am released, that I'll be able to serve them in return out of gratitude, but also because I am worthy for it. I am definitely qualified, you know, for it. So I'm thankful for that. Even though he was denied this time around, Muma says the fight is not over. She has a few more cards to play. Once you're denied, it's kind of put back on the very back shelf until it's time to pull it out again. And hopefully there'll be changes in Daniel's case that won't require us to go through that process. But if we have to, we'll fight for him again. It's early December now. Daniel has just turned 47. He's been transferred to a new prison. He and Muma are trying to find something positive to hold on to. It's been less than two months since the parole commission's denial. You know, you just get to the point where you're just not expecting anything positive in this case. You're not expecting things to go the way they should. And then... Something totally unexpected happens. I was en route somewhere and saw the email and actually did pull over to look at the print and had to read it several times. A ruling from the North Carolina Supreme Court that could change everything for Daniel. I was emotional for Daniel because it's been so long since before he was arrested that anything positive has happened. On the next episode of Follow the Truth, Daniel gets his first break ever from the courts. Hope is now back on the table. He was excited. Everybody was excited. Everybody was excited, and justly so. That's next time on Follow the Truth. Track the case on social media at Follow Truth Pod. Read my blog, transcripts, and case files at followthetruthpod.com. If you like the show, 
we'd appreciate you telling a friend about it. This episode was written by me, Amanda Lamb, mixed by Mark Maximov. Anita Norman Lee is our production manager. Shelley Leslie is executive producer and head of WRAL Studios. Original music is by George Hodge and Lee Rosevear. The show is represented by Melinda Mara Sinoni and Legacy Talent Entertainment with branding and digital marketing by Capital B Creative. Thanks for listening. Leave a comment and share this video with your friends. With daily uploads, there will always be a conversation.